Thank you all very much for, for coming to our event. Um, uh, as you can see, we, we have a host of young evangelicals in our midst, and um, I, I hope that the conversation uh, is uh, stirring and uh, insightful. Uh, before I, I turn it over to our, our panelists here, um, I think there are safe and non-safe issues in uh, in the church, in the broader community, in, in the nation. Uh, safe issues I would qualify as things like human trafficking and uh, fighting child so fighting against child how do you say that fighting to free child soldiers that would be the best way to put it right mm -hmm. yeah and uh, or, or malaria tuberculosis those types of issues are are safe really because the right and the left is pretty much in common agreement that malaria is bad and people should <laughs> die from it okay then, then there are non-safe issues and those non-safe issues uh, not only divide the nation, but they divide the church as well. And those non-safe issues tend to be those ones that we perhaps would call the big three. That would be abortion, uh, same-sex marriage, and religious liberty. Uh, many young evangelicals have been raised in the height of uh, the power of, of what is, a, is called the religious right, the moral majority, um, have, have lived through those battles uh, in that have taken place in the public square and are, I think, reluctant to engage in a lot of the, the, the manner that the discourse is taken over throughout their lives, basically. And um, a, re a recent article in uh, Relevant magazine which is, uh, at one point, uh, you know, was the evangelical, young evangelical magazine of reference. Um, I recently wrote an article uh, titled, 10 Challenges Facing the Next, Facing Us in the Next gen uh, Decade. And the us here, of course, is, like I said, uh, young evangelicals. And, and like many uh, such publications, the first the first horse out of the out of the gate is uh, Christians hate gay people. I mean, that, that's where you start, I guess, which is unfortunate because it's not true. And uh, the challenge is, of course, then where do you go from there? Um, but of course, the the real discourse in in that article was we need to broaden this definition, understanding of what we get into. We need to address immigration, climate change. And uh, probably the most appalling was um, was pro-life 2.0, which was basically everything but pro-life. <laughs> really, that's how it goes. And so we have gathered here a a panel of young evangelicals: uh, Andrew Walker from Heritage, uh, Eric Tietzel from uh, the Manhattan Declaration, Jessica Pohl from uh, Family Research Council and the IRD's own uh, Kristen Rudolph to uh, kind of uh, debate or dis not debate but more discuss uh, how young evangelicals move forward in the midst of perhaps a post-culture war in America, if that's even possible. Okay, so I will hand the the mic on, and uh, they each have roughly ten minutes, and then at the end of that we will have some. Time for question and answer, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll have some good questions. And uh, I'll see you in a few minutes. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be with you. As Luke said, my name is Andrew Walker, and I'm a policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation in their DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society. And I want to focus my remarks on kind of describing kind of what the situation is and, I, and a perspective on how to move forward. But I want to begin with sharing a tweet from a prominent Christian that I think summarizes our situation. This person said, I'm a Christian and I support marriage equality because part of loving your neighbor is desiring an equal justice under the law. This statement was tweeted by Rachel Held Evans on Tuesday morning as the Supreme Court heard Proposition 8. She is, as most of us know, a leading spokeswoman for more um, young, liberally minded evangelicals. Now, I don't want to look too much into this tweet, but I do want to share this tweet because I think it's profoundly 
emblematic of what plagues younger evangelicals. And I think that's a profound blurring of the lines that demarcate political categories from Christian ethical categories, and also an overly simplified and atrophied biblical hermeneutic. And were I to suggest whether this trend will get better or worse based on what I see out of young evangelicals, it's probably not going to get any better. So using that foil for my remarks, um, I want to talk about how we, um, in order to explain our unique placement as Christians in America, need to communicate to younger evangelicals what I'm calling an ecclesial ethical paradigm. And I'll explain that more towards the end. So we have a, a young evangelical ethos driven by ethical and political confusion multiplied by the fact that we lack an understanding of the church's communal and counter-polis nature, and polis meaning city and state. And I think there's a pivotal distinction here that I want to explain. In most Anabaptist thought, which I'm not an Anabaptist, the church represents an anti-polis posture, meaning that the church is entirely opposed to culture. A counter-polis approach to political engagement, however, means that the church offers, by her own example, an alternative to whatever polis she finds herself in. The church is not against the culture, but offers a better culture. We are, as um, Oz Guinness has said, we are against the world, but also for the world and our unique kingdom witness. And for the moment, I think this is how the church should understand herself, especially in light of cultural Christianity's decline in America. But for a moment, let me return to the above-mentioned tweet and discuss what this further symbolizes. Liberal evangelicals have long ago foreclosed on what I would call a sola scriptura ethic, one of the great ideas coming out of the Reformation, and they instead have adopted a sola cultura ethic, meaning that they place, uh, it's, an, it's a, a hermeneutic that places the cultural lens before biblical fidelity. This ethic finds resounding acceptance in liberal wings of American Christianity, but notice this hermeneutic not only accommodates, but actually justifies the claims of a broader, secular, and liberalized political order. Where a prevailing attitude takes shape, somewhere and somehow, we find people willing to Christianize whatever issue is at stake. So we think, uh, you know, more recently of progressive evangelical Tony Jones. He wrote a blog post exploring how premarital <coughs> sex ought to be considered a Christian virtue. So this is this just shows the progression in how we handle our, our, our ethics. So in Ms. Held Evans' tweet that I shared earlier, what we see there is, is American liberty as sacrament. But we also see it being used to undermine Christian ethical authority and sanction patently unbiblical relationships. Seen here, human sexuality as designed by God is cast asunder and exchanged instead for enlightenment ideals of equality built on social contract theory. But notice what happens. By elevating equality under the law as she does, she actually contributes to the naked public square by insisting that Christian interpretations of the public square should be subjected as a matter of first priority to the claims of liberal democracy. And there is simply very little that is Christian about that. So political confusion put, put aside for the moment, Evangelicalism, I think what, what is plaguing us is that we've become a very and distinctly unecclesiastical movement as a whole. One less defined and governed by our local churches and denominations, and governed more by an amorphous culture that claims no existing center. Lacking a center, evangelicalism has failed to grasp the nature of the church, which in Greek is ekklesia, which means we're the called out ones, the called out assembly. So building off an earlier formula, let me propose that the church should under understand itself as a called out assembly against the world, but also for the world. Now, I don't want to be overly depressing, but I want to give an honest assessment of how I see the situation. And I, I do believe that Christianity in America is entering a new phase of existence, one where cultural marginalization will likely intensify before it gets any better. So to forge ahead, we need to understand the basis of our cultural existence and discover new ways to navigate through increasingly hostile territories. Check the time here. All right. So to offset the shifting sands of evangelical identity in America, one that is politically confused and ecclesiastically indifferent, I suggest we develop new paradigms for being Christian in America, or what Jay Budachevsky from University of, or UT Austin, University of Texas at Austin says, that we need a cultural apologetic. So being on the policy side of things, let me offer three recommendations, policies, or paradigms for Christians uh, how to navigate our cultural political landscape with especially younger evangelicals 
in mind. I think we're going to be seeing a time where we are what I would call the moral minority instead of, instead of the moral majority. American Christians may be entering their exile. And while I don't believe in fixed determinism, uh, the episode, for example, involving Louis Giglio's removal from the inaugural festivities was as indicative of where we are in the culture as anything I've seen in recent time. And as Christians debate marriage, uh, Christians will need to see themselves not as victims, but as a moral minority that may experience personal and economic backlash for holding the scriptural authority. We may need to, for the first time in American religious history, embody the mindset of a political minority. Secondly, I think we need to embrace an Augustinian realism. And I'm kind of drawing my remarks here from Michael Cromarty at a recent address he gave. I think he's exactly right. Writing amidst the decline of the Roman Empire, Augustine wrote The City of God, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. And in it, he makes a clear distillation between the city of God and the city of man. The city of man being governed by earthly appetite and the city of God being guided by those inhabitants who have their affections set on God. So we need to embrace the tension of being Christians in an environment that is unwelcoming to our doctrine and ethics. And while never withdrawing from culture, we must acknowledge the imperfectibility of society and our own imperfectibility as Christians and what we strive to bring about in culture. We must guard against defeatist retreat, but also triumphalist excess. And finally, this is kind of where this is culminating, is we need to adopt what I'm calling an ecclesial ethical center axis. The realities discussed above of being a minor moral minority and embracing an Augustinian realism can only be recovered in the gathered church as we embrace a more communal understanding of the church. As an example, when we speak of life, marriage, and religious liberty, hat tip to my friend Eric here, we often do so as extracted political issues couched in the grammar of American rights. While this is not wrong, and in fact it is right, it does not contribute to forming a distinctly Christian social ethic, born of the one holy lowercase c Catholic church. We must, I would say as a first priority, take on a more ecclesiastical grammar with our uh, with young evangelicals. We also need to, we need less Christian politics and more an understanding that sees political reflection as a sub-discipline of the Christian ethical tradition. Please hear me. I'm not saying we withdraw from politics, absolutely, at all. I'm saying we need to figure out how to do it in a way that appropriates an understanding of, of, of the church involved. We must determine that ethics will determine our politics, not our politics, our eth ethics. We need to look to the church's internal structures of word and sacrament to be our North Star. I think we also need to embrace the surrealism and the oddities of the Christian faith and to take on this unique identity. We must acknowledge that the American church is not a product of the American experience. Instead, the American church, as where any church is located, is God's distribution of grace where the forces of barbarism and secularism seek to devour. We are, not we are not Americans having a Christian experience, I would argue. Instead, we are Christians having an, Ameri uh, having an American experience. I'm the most hopeful person I know, and I've just spent the past few minutes uh, casting a pall over this. But Christian hope is unshakable. Um, but I don't think this should prevent us from having honest assessment. And I, I think Benjamin Franklin, his words were quite apt. He said that we must indeed all hang together, or assuredly we shall all hang separately. But let me end on the so-called so culture war for a few minutes. Um, whether ha there has been an actual rise in the nuns, this much is true, and I think you would all agree with me that America does seem more secular and hostile toward conservative evangelical expressions of faith. Uh, cultural Christianity is dying, I, I, I do believe, um, but the cultural disputes will never cease. And so we must approximate how the culture wars, or the, how world in a post-culture war world ought to continue. And I think we ought to embrace an idea of history writ large. And let me end on an encouraging note here. Wherever culture goes, we must remain faithful and we must embody a political ethic that takes a longer view of history. One that recognizes that we, 2,000 years after the ascension of Christ, could still be living in a period of the early church. We need to see history not from our fixed point in history, but from the transforming effects of how our faithfulness, right here and right now, will transmit the faith to later generations of Americans. While I doubt we'll face the afflictions experienced by the early church's martyrs, we should take stock of one reality. As Christians went to the lions in the first and second centuries, none of them had in their purview that within a few generations, 
the Emperor Constantine would be baptized. Yet acts of faithfulness then, and, and, and now in whatever context, led to the advance of the faith. And you might even say that the blood of the martyrs was not only the seed of the church, it was the seed of the empire's conversion. And so to end, I want to just make one final kind of clause, is that to be the church of the future, I think we must become the church of the past moving forward. Way to get the uh, uniform. <laughs> uh, I graduated from Wheaton College in 2006 and immediately began a master's program at Azusa Pacific University in LA. Then I took a job at Colorado Christian University for a couple of years before moving to the American Enterprise Institute and most recently the Manhattan Declaration. Each of these experiences helped me to understand the current state of evangelical political discourse, but especially the way that young evangelicals, which we're calling millennials, think about the relationship between faith and culture. And one story from my tenure with the Values and Capitalism Project at AEI illustrates well what is going on. I was explaining the tension that exists between modernity and Christianity and the implications of that discord for our work to one of our interns, who was a student at a Christian college. Nodding along as I went on and on, she interrupted my eloquent lecture and said, yeah, it's like we go to church, but we also watch The Daily Show. That's exactly right. <laughs> the troubling relationship between Christianity and its cultural surroundings is nothing new. A whole chunk of the New Testament's devoted to instructions for churches in Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, and Rome, struggling to figure out what it means exactly to be Christian. 2,000 years later, the church continues to struggle with similar questions, but with a twist. The sect went viral. Some folks even got on a boat and established a new nation based on the idea that human beings were endowed by God with certain inalienable rights. And so the script was flipped. It was no longer about carving out a unique Christian witness in the midst of a secular culture, but about preserving the true Christian story in a vaguely theistic culture. Or, as my intern might explain better, there's a showdown. Orthodoxy versus what I call Oprah-doxy. <laughs> Orthodoxy requires the cultivation of what my professors at Wheaton called the life of the mind. When considering an issue, orthodoxy lays out first principles and our non-negotiable truths, with the Bible as a touchstone, creating a framework through which the merits of ideas can be considered and their consequences evaluated. Oprodoxy, on the other hand, allows us to respond to issues without the hard, time-consuming work of thoughtful consideration. There are no immutable principles. Instead, we start with a base set of emotions, positive and negative. Love justice, inclusion, authenticity, and equality. These are good. Judgment, rigidity, stratification, these are bad. People and ideas are judged accordingly. Now, there was a time in America when ideas were taken seriously, considered carefully, and implemented cautiously. When Abraham Lincoln ran against Stephen Douglas, they engaged in debate seven times in three months. Each time, one candidate would speak for 60 minutes, the other would give a 90-minute response, followed by a 30-minute rejoinder, and the nation was captivated. Uh, Newt Gingrich wants to try this again. Uh, more recently, William F. Buckley's firing line gave the stalwart grandfather of the modern conservative movement an opportunity to engage in lengthy dialogue and debate with leading intellectuals in a variety of fields ranging from politics to literature. In 1988, the show was reduced from 60 minutes to 30, and in 2000, Buckley stepped down for good. <coughs> Intellectual curiosity still exists in pockets in the United States, but more common is a pseudo-intellectual curiosity of the sort evidenced by Sunday morning talk shows and Starbucks. One need not explore the history and heritage of furniture, for example, to benefit from the appearance of taste. That's what Pottery Barn is for. <laughs> more common still is intellectual abandonment. Americans, especially the millennials and the unnamed generation behind them, are feeling their way through life, not thinking. Their e-motion is informed by a culture which promotes and preaches, baby, you were born that way, and is subsidized by a civil society built on shifting sand, as Andrew said. 
resulting in an ever-expanding nanny state that refuses to allow its chicks to experience negative consequences. This is Oprah Doxy. One need look no further than modern evangelicalism to see the unbridled embrace of Oprah Doxy. There are exceptions, of course, but these can best be understood as safe harbors for the few who somehow escaped what Aldous Huxley called the hypnotic process, which is manifest in our day in public education, on television, and in church. Millennial evangelicals, those who want to go to church and watch The Daily Show, want desperately to interface seamlessly in American culture. The social justice causes promoted by the evangelical left provide an opportunity to increase one's cultural cachet while ostensibly serving the Lord. It used to be that one could simply care for someone or something. That's not true anymore. Today, young evangelicals have a passion for coffee plantation workers in Peru, for example. But when one's passion is driven by social cues and peer influence, isn't it just a fad? Tom Shoes are big among young evangelicals who see an opportunity to help the poor while satiating their desire to consume. When passion is manifest by cute shoes sold at Urban Outfitters, isn't it just a fad? Indeed, among evangelical millennials, passion looks and sounds a lot like fashion. And this is life according to Oprah Doxy, not the precepts of scripture. Today, a majority of young evangelicals still vote for Republican candidates and hold conservative positions on major policy questions like abortion, marriage, and the rule of government. In 2008, just 32% of evangelical millennials voted for Barack Obama, compared to the 66% he received at the overall youth vote. Evangelical young people continue to rank abortion as a top issue of concern, even as the overall number of issues they care about expands. In the secrecy of the voting booth, young evangelicals are free, even if just for a minute, to think. And right now, they remember that snuffing out the lives of the unborn is evil. They may not join the marches or write the op-eds, but they vote their values. As I see it, the goal of the evangelical left is to erase young evangelical intuitions about moral prioritization. Mm -hmm. The political left is inextricably married to the murder of unborn children. But if the evangelical left can provide cover for young evangelicals by convincing them that Priuses and preferential tax treatment matter as much as people, maybe they'll pull the other lever. Mm -hmm. My job, our job, is to keep the main thing the main thing. As the Manhattan Declaration makes clear, there are many issues worthy of Christian concern and action, but some are more important than others, or more foundational than others. Why do we care about the poor, about immigrants, and about prisoners? We care because we recognize that each human being carries the full dignity of a being created in the image of God. Our concern for coffee workers must stem from that, and our approach to solving the problem be organized accordingly. Our ethics start with the inherent value of human life, and life begins in the womb, and little lives deserve healthy, intact families, including a mother and a father, in order to reach their fullest potential. And those families have the right to live according to their most deeply held convictions about the meaning of life, what's right and what's wrong, life, marriage, and religious liberty. The culture wars aren't over, but they're different. The political left has implemented a marketing campaign to persuade evangelicals that they can keep their values, their friends, and their dignity. It's a win-win-win philosophy whose prophets sell a lot of books, but it's a lie. The task before us is to create short, medium, and long-term solutions that renew the life of the mind <coughs> and a vibrant Christian culture willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with John Stewart, Oprah, and the others. Thanks. Thanks so much to IRD for inviting me here today. My name is Jessica Pohl. I'm with the Family Research Council, Managing Editor for Policy Publications. And I'm going to echo already a couple things that are said. Um, it is a privilege to be here and just comment and help you understand us and just work and partner as we're the younger generation. Um, are the culture wars over? 
I think it depends on how you answer the question. We are, as you know, rather young, a uh, child of the early 80s. Ronald Reagan's the first president we ever knew. We, unless we've studied history, we don't really know a world before MTV or No Fault Divorce. Uh, things have changed since you were our age and we realized that. And as already has been said, I personally don't see myself as an advocate for, quote, moral majority. I don't think a majority of Americans share my convictions any longer. But I also don't necessarily think of myself as a culture warrior. Let me explain a little bit of why. Uh, last August, as many of you will know, an armed gunman did enter my workplace. He confronted my colleague. But I don't think we always understand where the battle lines are drawn. And we misdraw those lines at the peril of our organizations, our causes, and ourselves. I think we do ourselves a great disservice if we look at those disagreements in primarily political terms. I'm not suggesting that any of our organizations should step away from truth about human sexuality or the dignity of life. But we sometimes give the impression that we're more interested in winning arguments and elections rather than seeking the good of the city and the good of people. So I think we should focus on what my friend Dr. Owen Strand has termed, quote, a new social witness. He lectured at FRC the, um, in the fall, and he made the following comments. This new social witness refuses to be seen as the religious wing of a given party. It is, however, grounded in the public witness of Christians offered in the past 30 to 40 years, and it's grateful for the sacrifices made by those who have gone before. This movement does not consider the church a pack, nor America the new Israel. Its tone is charitable and courageous, because this movement derives ultimate confidence and identity, not from the city of man, but from the city of God. So towards that end, I have a couple of suggestions. Um, some of them have been touched on, so I'm gonna try to shorten. I think we should pursue an unconfused civility. Uh, I invite us to show greater grace and unconfused civility in our conversations. I know civility can be a dirty word in some conservative circles, but that's why I tack on the unconfused. Um, I realize that our fundraising appeals often require urgency in order to get anybody to donate, but I've read fundraising letters for about half my lifetime, and to be entirely frank, some of them come off as apoplectic, apoplectic and panicky. And we need, to be, we need to be careful of that. Do we truly think, quote, the other side is, faith, is a faceless, relentless, secular force bent on destroying America? I think our advocacy must also leave open the option that our opponents are misguided, naive, and primarily concerned about living out their own version of the good life. And yes, in some cases, they're persistently blind to the way that God created the world. And in some cases, they literally want us dead. But if we're truly advocating for what is true, noble, pure, and praiseworthy, we should avoid embellishment, generalizing, and name-calling. I think we should also consider the possibility of odd bedfellow partnerships. Um, in some of what we tend to think of as the safe issues, um, sex trafficking um, was one of the ones mentioned. I think we should consider occasional contemporary partnerships with organizations that generally pursue a different worldview. One organization that I see doing this is the Center for Bioethics and Culture, uh, partnering in some cases with outsp outspoken feminists like Women at Now in order to help address issues in the um, commodification of the wombs. Um, some legislation in New Jersey you could talk more about that. <coughs> Um, another comment, just looking, we should be clarifying our anthropology, our understanding of humanity. Um, a biblically informed anthropology will encourage us to protect all humans as image bearers of the living God, cradle to grave. But some of the progressive and conservative disagreements regarding social and economic policies often stem from our different theological commitments and understandings of brokenness and evil. And I believe that some of my progressive friends will more readily locate the problem of evil primarily in the situational variables than in personal responsibility, which is problematic. But some of my conservative and libertarian friends run the risk, risk of ignoring the social contexts into which so many are born. So we, when we ignore those, we ignore the devastating implications of victimization, fatherlessness, abuse, 
failed education, systemic problems. And we fail to offer authentic hope, and we start suggesting that Christianity and advocacy is a graceless thing. As already mentioned, I think we should avoid immunitizing the eschaton. We should be patient with what we're actually focusing on and understand the limits of our own political advocacy. Uh, another comment, just in working with our generation, we are attempting to focus in a Facebook age. And in many cases, we are the Facebook generation. We're trying to be faithful and relevant amidst a clutter, active Twitter feed, 24-7 news cycle. We know more about the world events, things going on, on the other side of the world, and needs than many of our parents and grandparents did. But we're often more distracted and more fragmented. In the dizzying swirl of information and, quote, friendships, we can run the risk of detaching ourselves from authentic, in-the-flesh communities. And we're tempted to find that our own churches, families, civic society, neighborhoods are too small for our grand ideas. Um, I suggest that we are energetic and ready to partner and do big and good things. Um, and we certainly invite your partnership and suggest that this rising generation of Christians, regardless of political affiliation, should place a higher priority in individual relationships, hidden faithfulness, and commitment to a local body of believers. Uh, I'd also like to encourage authentic friendships. It's been a humbling reminder to me how God has used his people, people like William Wilberforce, D Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King, to organize great social resistance to social evils. But it is the paradox of the Christian life that God often uses individuals who are prepared to be small, hidden, faithful, and accountable to other believers. So we might be called, I believe we are called to wrestle with monumental injustice, but we will be most effective when we remain attentive to the challenges at our own doorstep and the efforts that we can make to alleviate those problems. And we certainly invite your leadership and collaboration on those conspiracies. I think we can also practice telling more beautiful stories. Uh, the world often doesn't know what we are for, they often think we're against everybody's right to have fun. They think we're seeking to impose a theocracy. And we should give them absolutely no reason to believe that. Uh, truth will always have its enemies, but we shouldn't be afraid of the good, the true, the beautiful. And as Q&A permits, I'm happy to give examples of that. Thanks for your time. Um, for those of you who came in um, after Luke's introduction, um, I'm Kristen Rudolph, um, and I'm working on starting uh, an evangelical program here for the Institute on Religion and Democracy. Um, so from my perspective, I'm just going to share with you kind of a sketch of what the evangelical left kind of looks like and why, why it might be that young evangelicals are susceptible to, um, to sacrificing on those issues like sanctity of life, marriage, and religious liberty, unlike we've discussed. Um, so most often, it's presented not as a um, st stop, you know, abandon your pro-life convictions, abandon traditional Christian teachings, and come over here and advocate for climate control and, um, you know, pacifism and um, these sorts of things. It's not presented in that way. It's wrapped in the language of developing a consistent ethic of life. Um, and we hear this all the time from groups like Sojourners, Jim Wallace of Sojourners, um, from Shane Claiborne, and those types who, Rachel Held Evans, um, all these types who want to claim the label of evangelical, um, and that's debatable. Um, but they say, well, of course we want to protect the unborn. Um, of course we still uh, believe that, we, that Christians are called to do that, but that's not the only thing. Other things that we should focus on include um, protecting the environment, um, reducing poverty through welfare initiatives, um, things like this. Um, and like has been discussed before, that, that forgets that there are, is a hierarchy of issues. If you don't prioritize protecting the unborn above all else, which it ultimately expresses why do we care about protecting human life, why do we want a consistent ethic of life, if that should be the first thing, the unborn are the most vulnerable, um, it, it, it obscures that and confuses that. Um, and the most um, recent example I've seen of that was um, at the Justice Conference in Philadelphia this February. Um, I went up there um, in Philadelphia um, just, uh, just about a month ago. Um, 
and huge conference, about 5,000 people in attendance, many more satellite locations where the conference was um, shown all over the country. Um, and most of the people who attended there were probably between the ages of, you know, this demographic we're talking about, between the ages of 18 and 30, most would probably identify themselves as evangelicals. Um, uh, walking through the exhibitor um, room, there was not a single major national pro-life organization there. There was one pregnancy care clinic um, in the local area that was there, but there was not a single pro-life um, organization. Um, it, this is, we're talking about 200 exhibitors. Um, further, as far as the speakers at the conference, there was one mention of abortion but that was um, in, Ch in China, not one mention of abortion domestically. Um, and we're t this is a two-day conference, um, many speakers there. And more than that, they featured Cheryl Wu Dunn, who um, is an activist working on um, um, solving for the oppression of women worldwide. She spoke on that issue, um, and she talked about the imbalance gender ratio in China and India and did not mention, not a single time did she mention sex selective abortion, which is absolutely the major cause of the imbalanced gender ratio, but she didn't mention it once. She's, now she's not a Christian, so that's her perspective. However, the fact that she was there featured as a major speaker was very problematic and there was no point where that could be countered, there was no question and answer. So, you know, I don't know what the understanding these people attending the conference have of that issue, but they left without an accurate portrayal. And this is a Christian conference. This is a conference that presents itself as the, our generation pursuing justice in the name of Christ. Um, so that was very disturbing um, to me. But it kind of it illustrates what we're dealing with. It's a very insidious <coughs> sort of movement to try and pull away. Um, young evangelicals from the roots, um, more the traditional teachings, and to, um, to fall into cultural acquiescence. And um, so it's happening in very subtle ways. Um, so I also, like I mentioned, why, why, would, why would anybody, why would any young evangelical be susceptible to this? Don't we all know what the church teaches, what the Bible teaches on life? Well, I think that most, like was mentioned before, most young evangelicals do still affirm um, more conservative viewpoints. Most would still vote more conservatively, but they tend to, a lot of times, privatize that. And we see that most often in the marriage issue. They want to be able to say, yeah, well, sure, I believe that homosexual practice is a sin, but... I wouldn't want to impose that on the rest of society who doesn't share my um, opinions and beliefs. Um, and this, I think, this is very, very common. I hear this all the time. Um, and I think, honestly, it comes from a number of reasons. Um, it comes because we already have a very weakened understanding of what marriage is in our culture. Um, the young evangelicals have grown, they haven't grown up in a time when homosexuality is viewed as aberrant um, behavior. They have grown up <laughs> in a time where it's just another option. And, um, and they might not agree that it's right, but they don't see, they see their, their parents maybe, or their friends' parents have been divorced, um, or cohabiting, or you know, their friends are having sex before they're married. They're just this very... Um, loose definitions of what um, proper relationships are um, and t it's, it's just in the water um, tolerance and acceptance is in the water and that's how that's what we've grown up as a part of and contrary to popular opinion and belief the church doesn't always teach very clearly what a biblical um, position on view of marriage is um, so it's not it's not that um, young evangelicals are growing up hearing solid teachings on what God's plan for sexuality and marriage is, it's kind of um, not talked about all that often, and then they go off to college, wherever it is, even if it's at a Christian college, um, and they're confronted, um, or even earlier that than that in high school, they're confronted with um, I, these different ideas, and they, it sounds mean to say that um, I don't believe that 
marriage should be defined this way. Um, and so it's just there's not a strong foundation that they have to resist those trends. Um, so I think that um, one tangible step to take um, is to present a stronger message of what, um, why, why are we committed to protecting life, first of all? Um, what is it about um, the uh, Christian view of the human person as created in the image of God? How does that, the, how ought that to affect our interaction in the public life? And two, what is um, the Christian teaching of marriage? How has God designed marriage? And why does that matter? Why does it matter that we affirm that in public as well? Um, and like has been mentioned before, that arguments about that aren't necessarily going to be persuasive in the rest of society. We, our generation, um, between depending on what polls you look at, between 60 and 80 percent of the broader um, population of young mil of millennials um, affirm same-sex marriage, um, and that that's just how it is. And you know, we don't know where trends are going to go in the future. Nobody knows for sure what will happen, but. That's the situation, um, and so to stand up against that is a very um, challenging thing. You need a lot of courage to do that. Um, and so while arguments aren't going to necessarily change the culture, we need to make sure that um, young evangelicals have the arguments so that they can give a solid answer and know why that they believe the convictions that they do. Um, so. What do, we, what do we do about this? Um, how do we kind of counter this insidious evangelical left? Um, and I think, honestly, that we need to capture the imagination, um, use stories, and, and say that, no, it's not true that, um, the, that in the past we haven't had a consistent ethic of life. We have had a consistent ethic of life. This largely is the media's portrayal of the so-called religious right um, and the culture wars as being as caring only about you know the unborn until they're born and then we don't care about them anymore. That's absolutely not true, um, and we know that. But I don't think that your average um, young evangelical here who hears these stories all the time, I don't think that they know that necessarily. Um, and so I think we really need to be um, you know writing stories, telling stories.